Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's democracy is experiencing some eventful years. Last April, the ruling Senuri Party saw an unexpected loss in the parliamentary elections, and next year, in late 2017, President Park Geun-hye's term in office will end as new presidential elections are conducted. Until then, the opposition parties will likely try to consolidate an attempt to create a unitary platform around a single candidate in order to capture the Blue House. To learn more about South Korea's democracy, we met with Stephen Denny after April's parliamentary elections. We took a look back at the first three years of President Park Geun-hye's presidency and spoke about the attitudes and peculiarities that shaped the country's democratic process. Additionally, we asked for his opinion about the voices that see South Korea's democracy threatened by the authoritarian tendencies of the current administration. Stephen Denny is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Toronto and a doctoral fellow at the Asian Institute at the Monk School of Global Affairs. In addition to various academic articles, Stephen Denny is also a frequent contributor to The Diplomat and the managing editor of SinoNK.com. Stephen Denny, welcome to Korea and the World. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. What sparked your interest in the Korean Peninsula, and especially in the politics and society of South Korea? It's a long story, but I'll give you the short one. I lived in South Korea previously from 2008 until 2013. And while living here, I, as a person interested in politics, naturally developed an interest in South Korean politics and society. It's been more than three years since President Park geun took office in February 2013. If she would step down tomorrow, what would her time in office be remembered for? No two people are going to remember her in the exact same way. And while it's difficult and perhaps even dangerous to talk about legacies before a president has even stepped down, there are some things that we can consider. Let's look at, for instance, her foreign policy agenda and what she's accomplished in her three years in office. And let's start with everyone's favorite country, North Korea. With regards to North Korea, it's been more or less continuity between her predecessor, Im Young Bak, and the current sitting president, Park Geun-hye. She put forward her doctrine of trust politique, which was outlined in a foreign affairs article at the beginning of her administration, that basically outlined a policy of conditional engagement, whereby the South Korean government will engage with North Korea if it's willing to basically discuss its nuclear weapon program and its alleged nuclear weapons. This policy is, has a low tolerance for provocation, as we've seen most recently with the shutdown of the Kaesong Industrial Complex in reaction to a firing of missiles, or missile, which was a, an act of provocation in the eyes of South Korea. And this has also been a, a maintenance or a continuity in a congruence between the U.S. policy on North Korea and South Korea's policy on North Korea. The alliance, as many people have had it or have, have shown it to be, is as strong now as it ever has. And I think that is largely due to the continuity in the North Korean policy. Moving west or northwest, if you will, towards China, you see a greater engagement with Beijing. There's some things that we can look at which would evidence this. The first is in 2015, for the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, Park geun had a high-profile appearance wherever they were standing looking over the parade in a bright yellow jacket just a few people down from Xi Jinping. And you don't stand that close to the chairman Xi Jinping unless you're important, unless your country is considered important to China. Uh, also, before that, in 2013, something that many people may not have noticed, but the Park geun administration requested that a memorial to the patriot An jung gun and An jung gun was the fellow who shot Ito Hirobumi in 1909 on, at a Harbin railroad station. He sort of exalted as a great Korean national hero for fighting for the independence to protect the sovereignty of South Korea. Park geun uh, requested that a memorial be built, and that request was obliged. So today you can go to the, well, what is today, the old station in Harbin, and you can walk through a small memorial and look out at the spot where, where An jung shot and fatally wounded Ito Hirobumi. Uh, I think the obliging that request goes to show how strong, perhaps, arguably, the relationship is today, at high levels anyway, between Beijing and Seoul. Also, last year, you had the conclusion of the China-South Korea Free Trade Agreement. Strong trading partners, as China is with a lot of developed countries, Park geun wants to cultivate that relationship, that economic relationship, and concluding an FTA is one way to do it. She's also 
practice what is called summit diplomacy. You will notice that she travels frequently to countries that are considered important to South Korea, such countries in the Middle East and East Asia and elsewhere. So moving to the domestic sphere, one issue that is of major importance is the labor market. Two issues in particular, irregular employment and youth unemployment, are issues that the Park administration has vowed to deal with. And one way they're attempting to deal with it is to introduce labor flexibility, which would, in theory, encourage larger or medium-sized companies to hire youth onto the payroll. And one way that the administration is attempting to deal with this is to introduce a peak wage system, which would prevent people who have been with the company for longer from getting a raise simply based on seniority. In addition to that, introducing merit-based increases in pay rather than simply, again, seniority-based increases in wage. And again, this in theory will free up capital that larger companies could use to hire younger people. Whether that will actually happen or not is a matter of debate, of intense debate, but it is something that the administration is attempting to do. And with regards to irregular employment, they're attempting to introduce legislation which would better regulate the practice of irregularly or temporarily employing people. Many watchers of the drama Biseng will be familiar with the concerns that many Koreans have with regards to irregular employment. Biseng, which translates as a still life, is a drama which sort of captures the current zeitgeist in South Korea, the angst associated with employment, particularly irregular employment. And the main protagonist is employed initially as an irregular employee and doesn't end up getting hired on. The film ending I will not reveal in case we have any listeners who haven't watched it, but it's a good film to watch if you want to better understand the anxiety of irregular employment and the structural issue that the Park and administration is attempting to deal with. And many of these um, changes, particularly the peak wage system and the merit-based pay regulations, are being implemented this year. She's also, at least in rhetoric, tried to encourage companies to operate more creatively. She cites a lot the importance of a creative economy. And while that seems a bit like boilerplate or a phrase that doesn't have a lot of meaning, it refers to like new growth frontiers or industries where creative capabilities and high skills that will help produce capital intensive or skill based products is being encouraged. One example is the pilot program for internet only banks. This is, falls within the financial technology industry. FinTech, as you might heard, it's a bit of a buzzword, kind of like big data. And that is something new that Korea is trying out, which may or may not help cultivate interest in the so-called creative economy. But it's certainly something with which the Park Geun-hye administration is aware of, whether or not she will have adequately or effectively introduced measures or ideas that will lead to a decrease, say, in youth unemployment or an increase in the number of those working in creative economy jobs is again an open question, and time will tell. Ever since her election, it seems that her presidency has been plagued by numerous scandals. Could you tell us more about these? There certainly have been a fair number of scandals. Scandals are common to any presidency in any country. Some people are one to say that her presidency has been marked by more scandals than usual. I think that's an open empirical question that we could answer. But yeah, let's recap some of these scandals so as to be fair. Upon entering and assuming office, they had the revelation of the national intelligence scandal. It was found out that on two separate occasions or in two separate instances, employees of the National Intelligence Service had interfered in the election by manipulating public opinion on message boards. That is, of course, problematic. You also had the continuous problem of of making a cabinet particularly nominating and getting through the process of nomination, the position of prime minister, which is troubling to say the least. And you had the Sewol Ferry tragedy and what many perceive to be a botched reaction or handling of the situation and a very knee-jerk sort of reaction to large amounts of social discontent, perhaps best marked by what seemed to be a rash dissolving of the Coast Guard Now, of course, the Coast Guard wasn't fully dissolved. It was more of a cutting the head off so as to placate popular demand and to quell popular indignation. But in in any case, it was a scandal. You had the dissolution of the United Progressive Party. Now, we're listing this as a scandal, 
and perhaps addressing it as a potential one is instructive because while the UPP, a former minor party in, in South Korea, was dissolved by the Constitutional Court after the request was made by the Pakane administration, whether this is a scandal or not is a matter of debate. To sort of reiterate, the Pakane administration, for reasons related to national security, namely North Korea, it was alleged that the UPP was harboring pro-North Korea assembly members, which in the minds of many was a threat to South Korea's national security. The conviction of Lee Seok-gi, who was a former high-profile member of the UPP, didn't help matters. But when the case was taken up by the Constitutional Court of South Korea and the ruling, which was 8-1, to one, to dissolve the UPP was made, it created somewhat of a debate. And one of the key questions asked was, and still is, is the Constitutional Court independent? Now, while they took up the request of the Park Geun-hye administration, which could be construed as political, you then have to ask yourself, well, is the Constitutional Court independent? Well, it seems to be, at least. And independence of the court is a key feature of a democracy. And if we are to see the Constitutional Court as independent, then we can see the process by which the UPP was dissolved as more or less a democratic process. It might be one which is in no small way political, but is also one that is seemingly democratic. So maybe that's not such a scandal after all, but that's a debate that will continue to be had. Uh, just a couple other issues, because I know we want to move on to a few other topics, but they had the bribery list scandal where a high-profile individual left a list of politicians who were being paid, and this individual had left this list after committing suicide in angst or whatever reason that he chose to take his life. And the issue was is seen as not being properly dealt with by the Park Geun-hye administration. And in fact, in pursuing her summit diplomacy foreign policy agenda, when the scandal was ongoing, she had left. And this scandal also approached the time of the Sewol Ferry incident, which may or may not be a scandal in itself, might just be bad politics, but certainly rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And then lastly, we have the ongoing history textbook debate. The administration is pursuing a renationalization of the production of history textbooks. It was partially liberalized in 2009, whereby it went from a fully nationalized process or a national process to one where that would be reviewed. So publishers could submit their books for review, and if they were passed, they could be sold to and used by schools. This is problematic for all sorts of ways, and I think is best sort of summarized by Benedict Anderson's edict that any history produced by the state is almost certainly false. He remarked that at some presentation a few years back in the University of Toronto, but it kind of stuck with me. And a lot of people will know Ben Anderson for his writings on the imagined communities, and he was a, an active critic of history and how it's written, an active critic of the writing of history, rather. So for that reason, and for many others, that is seen as, well, let's not call it scandalous, but highly contentious. Many of her critics accuse her of walking in the footsteps of her father, Park Chong-hee, who ruled South Korea in an authoritarian fashion from 1963 to 1979. In the most recent edition of the Democracy Index by The Economist, for example, the country dropped out of the category of full democracy. What's your stance on this, and what role does President Park play in this context? Well, that's, that's a big question, and I know it's a question that is important to many people and a question that's hotly discussed. I think that despite the brouhaha surrounding the father-to-daughter connection, Park Geun-hye, even if she wanted to be her father, cannot possibly be her father. Her father came to power at a time when democratic institutions were quite weak. And that's what gave him the ability, rather, to promulgate and implement the Yushin Constitution in the, in the early 70s. I think a lot of people forget, too, that Park Chung-hee didn't rule with an iron fist for the entire duration of his tenure. The 60s, the beginnings of economic development, when Park Chung-hee had, was still new to power, are called by, if I can cite Byung-gu Kim, Korea University, soft authoritarian years. It wasn't the 70s, the times of the emergency decrees, that people are probably thinking of when they think about the dictatorial years of Park chung -hye. But in any case, Park geun cannot be Park chung -hye. There are entrenched and consolidated democratic institutions and norms that will prevent that from happening. With regards to 
the demotion of South Korea's democracy to something slightly less than. You know, it's an interesting debate. All democracies everywhere have problems. But one of the measures that caught my attention as I was looking through the methodology used to evaluate the world's democracies was the strength, or rather the coherence, of the opposition party, or a viable opposition party. And it's something that doesn't perhaps get talked about as much as it should, but despite whatever proclivities Puck and A might have, the so-called social liberal party in South Korea is not helping the situation. They've had a really hard time mounting a coherent, sustained, and effective campaign which could produce, or present rather, a viable alternative to the South Korean people. Pakane was democratically elected in 2012 with something like 51 point something percent of the vote. The elections were free and fair. Despite some controversial moves by her administration, she has not assumed the role of anything closely resembling a true authoritarian ruler. Independent of who she is, in terms of perception, is she not judged not just on her own merits, but frequently as the daughter of a dictator? How does that influence the perception of her in the media and by the public? Well, the media is largely responsible for framing issues and framing people. And the left-leaning media has had what's called a heyday with this particular frame. And that is, Park geun is the daughter of the former dictator Park chung hee therefore dot dot dot. So yeah, it's a framing game, and framing efforts can influence how people are perceived. So yeah, this is in part certainly due to framing, but it, it is also in part due to a number of the incidents or scandals that we talked about before, which are going to also influence how they see the Park geun administration. So who supports her nowadays? It's a good question, and it's a question that, if answered, will teach one a lot about the political orientation of South Korean society. So according to available data, those who support her are roughly two age cohorts, the 50s and the 60s plus. The latest Gallup Korea opinion poll shows that Park Kine has the lowest approval rating that she's had during her tenure. That's not surprising. In fact, it's expected. But the 60s age group still shows a vast majority supporting her administration and her and her time in office. Well, the 50s is the first time that more have said that she's not doing well than doing well. There might have been some fluctuation, but it's notable. But in any case, it's this 50s and 60s above where Park Geun-hye has enjoyed the greatest amount of support and the people who are most likely to support a conservative candidate. Once you go to the other age cohorts, the 40s and the 20s and 30s, those people are far less supportive, resolutely so, of Park Geun-hye. One thing that I don't think gets mentioned that is quite interesting is that this 50s age cohort, these are the people who came of age during the 80s. These are people from the so-called 386 generation of democracy activists. I think people sometimes tend to romanticize this generation, or at least misportray them as being predominantly progressive, when in fact, at least according to data with regards to the question of approval of a conservative administration, you see that it's quite conservative, or at least like 50-50 at best. And I think that's an interesting point that, well, I can't expound on it any further here, but it's worth further investigation. You know, this era of people who came of age during the democratic transition what do they believe now? This is an open and interesting question that I would like to see answered. As the South Korean population is aging and graying, are we going to see a growing dominance of the conservative parties? That's a good question. It's a question for an aging society. And it's a question that gets at, I think, two key concepts that are discussed by political scientists predominantly and others as well. And it's of life cycle effects, and generation effects. Life cycle effects we're all familiar with, the, the logic of which goes, as one ages, they tend to become more conservative. The generational effects is about the experiences that one has in their immediate post-adolescent years and how this will affect their orientation and political behavior, e.g. voting, uh, later on in life. Now, if the life cycle effects is going to explain a lot of what's going on, then yes, as a large percentage of the population becomes older, they will tend to be more conservative and they will vote accordingly. And as we also know, older people are more likely to vote than younger people. 
So in theory, it would spell more electoral success for a conservative party rather than a social liberal one. But if we have we've seen here generational effects, it could be something different. And we could see that the, say, the experiences of those who will soon replace, generationally speaking, the oldest generation, are those who came of age during the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Those are people in their 40s and, and early 50s. And you have to wonder how will that affect how they vote going forward? Which then begs the next question, who's proposing an alternative to what we have now? Which brings me back or brings us back to the issue of a viable opposition party. The opposition party, as it's currently constituted, is not effectively presenting a set of alternative policies which people can identify and vote on. I know we're going to talk about this more in a moment, but that point taken together with the natural proclivity of political behavior among people who age suggests, and only suggests, that the South Korean population is going to tend towards conservatism going forward. But that's just an educated guess. We don't know precisely what will happen, and we don't know what kind of effect long-term that things like the Asian financial crisis, for instance, will have on the political behavior of people who are now constituting the older cohorts of society. While it is the older generations which are expected to be conservative, as you just said, you wrote that young Koreans are national security conservatives. And you also write about a new nationalism. Could you tell us more about that? So national security conservatives refers to the similarity in opinion with regards to North Korea between young South Koreans and older South Koreans. There's an expectation that young people will be open to, say, engagement with North Korea, or they will hold a more progressive or friendly attitude toward their neighbor to the South, when in fact, they see North Korea as just another country. So when the North engages in provocations, the youth of South Korea respond in a way that they might respond to any other country acting in such a way which is to say that they expect their government to respond as a country would to any other country who threatens or perhaps even violates the territorial sovereignty or the security of the country. The new nationalism expression refers to a way that young people envision, understand, and see South Korea vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. It's related to, but much more expansive than the national security conservatives expression, which is referring specifically to attitudes towards North Korea. The new nationalism is about a group of people, a cohort within society, young people who see South Korea as to cite something as borderline boilerplate, strong and prosperous, is a country that is economically developed, democratic, a member of the OECD, thus a member of developed nations, and attitudes follow from these sorts of larger structural developments. Now, of course, it's not all grand or great things. There are the issues confronting South Korea that are confronting other advanced industrial societies the downward pressures of global capitalism, the social issues, economic issues associated with uh, advanced industrial economies, some of which we cited before, which is youth unemployment, just unemployment in general, and maintaining acceptable levels of growth, a magical 3%. They're also dealing with that. So the attitudes are not all, we're South Korea, we're strong and prosperous, we're great. Uh, it's also much more expansive than that, but it's an attempt to better understand how attitudes and, and political behaviors and, and national identities have changed in this new era. If we have this new nationalism on one side, what exactly is old nationalism and how do the two differ? Perhaps it's best just to say uh, a different nationalism. New and old creates sort of a hierarchy, which I do not wish to construct. But, you know, it's helpful to see certain populations by generations. And generations are made by sort of broader environmental experiences under which one comes of age. And the situation or the environment under which young people today are coming of age is very different from that of their parents and of their grandparents. So their grandparents came of age in the post-war era, very different from today. Their parents came of age in a time of struggle for democracy, or perhaps now during the times of economic struggle in the late 90s brought about by the Asian financial crisis. But young people today are, are coming of age in a very different time. And it stands to reason then, and data support this, that their attitudes and opinions will be different. You know, the thing about compressed modernity, which is what's used to describe South Korea's development, is it produces sharp and highly distinct generational differences. 
And I suppose what I'm doing with this new nationalism trope really is just trying to find like a catchy way of expressing or describing this different conception of what it means to be South Korean today vis-a-vis what it meant to be South Korea in 1995 and 1985 or 1975. And contrary to other countries where things tend to change a little bit more slowly, as we all know, development in South Korea was rapid and so was the social change. So I'm attempting to sort of capture and juxtapose that to previous periods. On a side note, what about North Korea? Are we witnessing a similar change uh, in the way they perceive the other Korea? Or does it remain the same as it was 60 years ago? Particularly among younger people, things are quite different. I think today we're witnessing the emergence of a more resolutely South Korean national identity in which the meta discourse on unification upon which things like ethnic nationalism are built do not resonate with younger people today who are more concerned with status, modernity, or jobs. And so what North Korea is to younger people today is just another country. And I think the data support that reading of the situation, but it's still an open question as to what exactly it means to be South Korea for younger people. President Park was elected in 2012 with 51.6% of the votes, as you mentioned earlier. This is the highest share won by any candidate since the beginning of free and fair direct elections in 1987. Who were her constituents? Let me answer the question geographically. I can tell you who didn't vote for Park Geun-hye. People in and around Seoul largely did not vote for her, and people in the Southwest resolutely voted for the other candidate, the liberal candidate, Moon Jae-in. This voting pattern is representative of a phenomenon called regionalism, and it's used to describe the regional voting proclivities in South Korea most associated with the Southwest and the Southeast. The Southwest, which is North and South Jola provinces, are considered the stronghold of support for liberal candidates. And the Southeast is considered the stronghold for conservative candidates. This regionalism is a historically produced phenomenon and is explained best by the developmental practices or the biases in resources allocated and distributed for developmental purposes during the Park Chung-hee years. Park Chung-hee tended to favor the Southeast, where he was from, and Park Chung-hee tended to discriminate against the Southwest, which has traditionally been a stronghold for opposition to conservative politicians and conservative policies, and thus certain voting proclivities developed from there. Other regions of Seoul uh, are less certain, but right now you see that in and around Seoul and in the Southwest are where you're getting most votes for, let's say, non-conservative politicians. And we can talk a bit more what I mean by that. Last April, the country elected a new parliament and the outcome was surprising to many. Could you briefly summarize for listeners what happened and how did region play into this? So first of all, the ruling party, the Sinuri party, lost their majority. They lost their majority because one, one of the two liberal parties did better than expected, and also because some of the independents who won their seats, who were former Sinuri politicians, but are no longer so. And the reason that they're no longer with the Sinuri party is because they were not given the nomination. The nomination process in in South Korea The party process is internal, so members are awarded the nomination. They're not selected by, say, a more democratic process. It's an issue that has been on the docket for reform for some time now, but it is yet to be reformed. So a number of independents now were former Senuri politicians. But in addition to that, and what will interest many and excite many more, is that the liberal parties did slightly better than expected. It's not unusual at the end of a long majority rule for a party to not fare well in legislative election. So it's not exactly surprising, but it was slightly unexpected that the now two liberal parties, the Toburo Minjudang or the Minju Party and the Gukminidang, the People's Party, did as well as they did. The reason why we have two liberal parties right now, which I hasten to add is not historically unprecedented, it has happened before, but the reason we have it right now is because the former main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, split. You had high-profile member An Cho-su leave to start a new party, which is now the People's Party. Joining him was a former high-profile defector, uh, Jung Jung-bae, 
who is a major figure in the Honam political arena. And Honam is another way to refer to the southwest of South Korea. You had these two parties gain seats, which, as described, resulted in Senuri Party losing its majority. Now, to go back to regionalism again, the distribution and the breakdown shows something interesting. The Minju Party did well in and around Seoul, and the People's Party did well in the southwest. So what you see here is a split between two areas where the Liberal Party tends to do well, between two different parties. So you have effectively a split left. Where this is going in the future, we do not yet know. The, the creation of this People's Party is quite new, and what they're campaigning for or on is still unclear. Whether it's going to become clear at any point is anyone's guess. A few months before the election, when the liberal opposition split up, you wrote that, and I quote, personal politics stifle Korean democracy. Which personalities were you referring to, and how exactly do they harm South Korea's democracy? Well, I was referring to two things, both a general phenomenon and some specific individuals. The phenomenon of personality politics is a trait of a political system wherein parties have not consolidated or parties are not fully programmatic, or perhaps even entirely non-programmatic. And what I mean by programmatic is having clear, predictable policy platforms that politicians run on. Parties stand for certain positions, and they do not stand for others. In South Korea, you would be hard to find specific concrete policies that parties regularly campaign for. In fact, I would argue they don't exist, because South Korean political parties are non-programmatic. Instead, they're driven by charismatic, or somewhat charismatic, popular individuals. That is what drives their popularity and the ebbs and flows of party politics at the popular level. So more recently, we see the rise of An cho Su, who may or may not be charismatic, but his personality and what he represents is extraordinarily powerful. And it has resulted in him being very popular, which has enabled him to start his own party. An cho Su, as many people will know, was a successful entrepreneur, a self-made man, and represents, in the eyes of many, a new kind of politician, which he promotes as Sechongchi, or new politics. Pick any random median voter in South Korea and ask them to explain what new politics means, and the answer you get will likely be somewhat vague, because it's vague, the phrase itself. It's not a specific policy position. And what he has written and what he says does not indicate a support for or promotion of any specific policy. And in fact, that was one of the reasons why he teamed up with Chung Chung Bae is because he needed the support of another kind of charismatic popular leader. And Chung Chung Bae, as I explained earlier, is a popular figure in the Jola provinces. And by allying himself with this particular charismatic individual, he was able to buoy his support. He was able to garner votes and secure the rise of a new party. The same could be said for the other liberal party, the Minju party. They are right now, I would argue, lacking a charismatic leader. They had Moon Jae-in, who was the previous presidential candidate, a former lawyer, and someone who represented the leftist politics of yore, someone who would fight for democracy, who would struggle against oppression. But even with Moon Jae-in at the helm, he failed, I, ar I would argue, to present like a clear alternative to, well, at the time, the Lee Myung-bak administration. So going up against a conservative party that had the incumbent discount that was coming from a position of power, which it's always harder to lose than it is to win. Uh, he wasn't able to present like a clear alternative. And in fact, listeners may recall who were following domestic politics at the time in 2012, An Cho Su arrived right before Moon Jae-in started campaigning for president, or perhaps it was even after he had already begun. And he inserted himself as a candidate for the Democratic Party at the time. And so you had this competition between two somewhat or clearly uh, charismatic individuals. So that, I think, is indicative of charismatic politics. And it's harmful to democracy because it prevents the formulation of more programmatic platforms that can lead to the development of clear policies that people can choose from. So if you don't like the situation right now, then you can choose the alternative. But right now, the alternative is kind of the same as what you have now. 
Hokkien-e came to power on the twin pillars of economic democracy and revitalization, among other things too. Those are policies that anyone might promote in South Korean and is not something that's specific to the conservative party. Is it a fair assessment to say that, in many ways, democratic elections in Korea are somewhat akin to a popularity contest in the Liberal Party, and is it the same in the Conservative Party? It's a good question. And in fact, I've been challenged before presenting this thesis of charisma-driven party politics in South Korea. It does indeed seem as if the Conservative Party maintains a certain coherence that is lacking in the Liberal camp. Take, for instance, the last name change for the Conservative Party. During Lee Myung-bak's tenure, it was Hanara Dang, the Hana ruling party. They changed their name for the leadership of Park Geun-hye to Seonuri Party, or Frontier Party. But that name change didn't come about as a result of a breakdown in the party structure. There's always some intra-party wrangling. Factional politics, in fact, drive party politics. But you, you don't tend to see the same sort of intra-party problems plague the Conservative Party like they do the Liberal Party. And I think in part of this has to do with the fact that the Conservative Party is banking electorally on the legacy of economic development. And while they might not make it quite clear in terms of like programmatic platform, it is sort of assumed or the Conservative Party in Korea is associated with economic growth and development or the maintenance of the economy. It's sort of it's still an open question, though, because if these parties are still non-programmatic, why doesn't the Conservative Party behave in a way similar to the Liberal Party? So in conclusion, considering the different factors we've talked about, demographics, regionalism, popularity even, where do you see South Korea's domestic politics or party politics going in the long term? Well, this year will be a year to watch. It'll be interesting to see how the party politics of the left unfold in the lead up to the next presidential election. Right now we have a split left for all intents and purposes. Leaders on the left know that a split left is not good, electorally speaking. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to win the presidential election with two leftist parties putting forward candidates. So it'll be interesting to see how they try to resolve their differences. It's been attempted before. In fact, the New Politics Alliance for Democracy, which was the main opposition for most of Park Geun-hye's time in office, was a compromise. It was a combining of forces between Moon Jae-in, who represents the Liberal Party of Yor, and An chul Su, who represents New Liberal Politics, perhaps a more centrist, Blairite-like politician and politicking. So how they will or will not resolve the issues going forward, I think it will have a significant impact on the health and well-being of South Korea's democracy. Without a viable alternative, democracy is weaker when people don't have real viable choice or a real viable alternative. So I don't want to put all of the pressure on the liberal parties of South Korea to fix all of the governance issues and the problems facing South Korea today, but it is a major one. And going forward, if, let's say, An chul and those and the ideas that he's associated with, that he may not actually be articulating, are sort of implemented or formulated into a, a clear platform, it would be very interesting because you might see the development of a new liberal identity, which in fact I think is what we're witnessing right now is sort of growing pains, a transition from the period of the 80s and early 90s to today, where struggle doesn't win you votes, struggle doesn't win you popularity, performance and viable alternatives do. But to take us back to the issue of generations, a lot of the leadership, the people who are leading these parties or who are senior figures, are older and they're from that generation. And they define themselves as politicians by their pedigrees. And their pedigrees, in, like Moon Jae-in's, has to do with standing up to oppression and struggling to achieve things. And while that might make for a nice individual story, it doesn't necessarily make for good party politics, nor does it make for good policy so it will indeed be interesting to see how things develop this year. To finish off, many observers, both in South Korea and abroad, seem to be worried about the country's democracy. Are you worried? In short, no. Let me conclude with a little anecdote. I spent the last month or so in countries that are resolutely not democratic. And coming back to South Korea, 
felt like coming back to something that was resolutely not authoritarian or not politically exclusive. South Korea is a democracy. Maybe you can make an argument it's not fully consolidated for some of the reasons that we've talked about today, but it's made great progress. And the fact that so many people are concerned with the status of the country and the health and well-being of its democracy is a good sign. I would be hard-pressed to find any concerned, politically engaged citizen from a democratic country who didn't think there was something wrong with their democracy. I think it's just a common characteristic of democratic citizens. I suppose I am concerned, but only concerned in the same way that all other politically engaged people from democratic polities are concerned. Three months have passed since we recorded the first part of our interview. Have there been any major political developments since the parliamentary elections? Yes, unsurprisingly, there have been a number of political developments. Six by my count, and I'll review them in no particular order. First, according to the latest Gallup Korea presidential approval data, public opinion data, it appears that President Park's approval rating has bottomed out. It's in the low 30s now, about 33% overall. This is not exactly surprising. In fact, it should be expected. She's in the fifth year of her five-year presidential tenure. And if you look at it by age cohort, something we talked about previously, you see that the 60s plus is still her bedrock of support. 58% approve. In the 50s, an interesting age cohort because it is the 386 generation today. 42% approve and 49% disapprove. So more disapprove now than earlier in her tenure, President Park's tenure. But you still have a large number of people who support the administration. After that, the support really plummets. The younger people do not approve. The second is the Senuri Party has dropped in its approval as well. It has, for the better part of President Park's tenure, maintained a very comfortable lead over the social liberal party or parties now. But what this hasn't resulted in is a concomitant rise in support for either the Minju Party or the People's Party. There are simply more undecided. It will be interesting to see how the approval for or support for these parties shapes up in the coming weeks and months with the presidential election looming in December. Also, with regard to the Senuri party, seven ex-members have been reinstated. These were members who had left the party after they were not given the nomination prior to the parliamentary elections in April. The most high profile, if you will, of these members was uh, Yu Sung Min. He was a former so-called pro-park floor leader. In fact, all of these were considered to be park critics. So many people think that it was a strategic decision, a political decision, not to give them the nomination uh, because they were critical of, of the way in which Park was handling the administration and the decisions that she was making. And it goes to show that within the Senuri party, you also have a lot of intra-party wrangling, the type which destroys often the social liberal party or brings it down or splits it. The Senuri party, with the reinstatement of these seven former members, now has 129 seats. Uh, that's still not a majority. So they will still be required to work with other parties to pass legislation. The implication of this will become more clear next year when the new president is inaugurated. But for now, it's simply interesting to note that Senuri is, as was noted in previous questions, no longer the majority party. The next interesting development is Anjosu's resigning of his leadership post of the People's Party alongside his former co-leader, Chung Chung Bae. This is interesting because Anjo Su is, was seen and perhaps still is seen as a new politics candidate, as he portrays himself, a new politics politician, someone who is going to politic differently, more honestly and effectively. And with his People's Party, there was hope that he would be able to form a new and viable opposition to the conservative party, the Senuri Party. The resignation puts that into question to an extent. It certainly doesn't completely derail his political ambitions, but it certainly sets it back some. It'll be interesting to see how people respond to his stepping down, which was he stepped down because of alleged malfeasance of a People's Party politician and uh, took a responsibility as the party's leader. Uh, it will be interesting to see what he does in the coming months leading up to the presidential election. It is notable that in order to run for president, you cannot be the leader of a party. So him stepping down does not preclude him from possibly running for president. The next political development that I'll talk about is the jail sentence that's been handed down to Han Sang-gyun, 
who at the time, and still arguably is, the leader of the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions, KCTU. This five-year prison sentence was handed down by the Seoul District Court for his role, his instrumental role as leader in an anti-government protest last December. He was charged with injury to public officials and obstruction of traffic, among other infractions. And this is a clear sign that the government wishes to stamp out militant protests and send a message that it does not wish to negotiate with organizations like the KCTU on things like labor market reform or on anything, really. It is a bit of a, maybe a punch in the gut for people who are following closely the you know political developments in South Korea. A five-year sentence is quite long. And he was just protesting after all, wasn't he? I think it's an open question. Uh, the protest for which the protest which got him in trouble and has now landed him a five-year jail sentence. It was a large-scale protest last December, which brought out around 80 to 100,000 people, probably, of which there was a small contingent of violent protesters who confronted riot police, who were also employing probably quite strong measures of resistance, chemical-laced water cannons is one thing that upset some people. But it remains to be seen what this means, and... I don't have an in-depth comparative understanding of how other democracies have dealt with uh, people who they've seen being instrumental in violent protests. France has a long-running tradition of violent protests, and I'd be curious to know how the leaders of those protests are handled by the government of France and in other countries where you have protests that turn violent. But it is it does give us cause for concern, and we should certainly consider it and think about it a bit further and the implications that it has for government to labor relations and for you know the state of democracy in South Korea. The last issue that I want to bring up is the decision to install a terminal high altitude area defense system, otherwise known as THAAD, which will be deployed in Songju, Gyeongsan province. The US has agreed to install this cost-free to the Koreans. They're paying for it, which is different from the conversation that was being had a few years ago where the U.S. was shopping this to South Korea and asking him to, to consider buying it. South Korea's response at the time was, well, we'll develop our own indigenous terminal high-altitude area defense-like system. The thing to note here in terms of political developments, which isn't getting a whole lot of coverage, at least from the Western or the American perspective, is how this was handled domestically. The citizens of Songju City were not publicly consulted about the government's decision to install or to implement THAAD in its city. And if you, you look at the breakdown by the numbers of, you know, support and oppose, and you'll see that a majority of self-identified Sainuri supporters support the implementation of THAAD. A majority of Minju Party supporters oppose it. So it's a conservative liberal thing. The People's Party, it's around like 52%, according to the latest numbers that I saw, uh, support it. But Songju City is a conservative city. And yet you have a strong amount of opposition. And the reason you have that for people who would otherwise be predisposed towards support is because they weren't publicly consulted. And that it's a troubling outcome or development in military to civilian and in government to civilian relations. And I think the people of Songju have every right to be upset. And I think we, or those who are close followers of South Korean politics and those who are concerned about the health and well-being of South Korean democracy, uh, should pause and consider the implications of the government's riding roughshod over the opinions of the people of Songju and of any other city that might have been chosen. It didn't seem as if the government thought public consultation was necessary. Does this mean that, that this is an indication that, as uh, one friend of mine pointed out to me, that South Korea is, is really truly slipping into sort of neo-authoritarianism? No, I don't think so. I think this is an indication of the sort of paternalistic approach that the South Korean government takes to its governing of the nation. And sometimes a paternalistic approach can be rather uh, an anthem to, to you know, a democratic process. Uh, so that's certainly worth further discussion that I hope will be had in Korean, especially in Korean, among uh, the citizens of Korea. Looking to the future, what should we look out for? I do not know the future, and it's dangerous to play political Nostradamus. But I'll give you three things that you should look out for in the near future. The first is the future of the South Korean left. As we've discussed, it's currently split between the Minju Party and the People's Party. A split left is probably incapable of winning the presidency. And if they remain split leading up to the election, I think we can expect a conservative victory. You know, we know, that they know this. It is a pretty simple political point. I don't know how they will deal with it going forward or whether or not they will even be able to deal with it. 
but we should watch out for that. The second is labor market reforms. The second is labor market reforms. These are and will be, as we've discussed, uh, highly contentious and divisive issues, but ones that are probably necessary. There was a really good piece written by Jaeop Kwok, or Kwok Jaeop, entitled South Korea's Labor Reforms Come Up Against Social Convention. I recommend that everyone read it. I think he does a really nice job outlining what's at stake and how it runs up against what Koreans have grown up to expect with regards to employment and the nature of the labor market. The third is the presidential election. And I'll talk about that in, in this sort of way. I'm going to give you the four people who I think you should watch out for. I might not get the right person, but these are four people who are popular enough that they could and may likely run for president. On the conservative side, you have Kim Musung. Kim Musung is the former leader of the Senuri Party and of the so-called anti-park faction. He is relatively popular and experienced. He has name recognition, and he was in a leadership position for most of President Park's tenure. The second is Ban Ki-moon. It's an open question whether Ban Ki-moon is actually conservative or what that even means, but he has a lot of name recognition, and when he was in Korea recently, he made some comments that perceived to be quite conservative vis-a-vis North Korea, and there's a lot of speculation that he might run for president for the Senuri Party. The two I'll give you on the other side, the liberal side, are first, Moon Jae-in. Moon Jae-in is the former uh, leader of the MPAD. He has a lot of experience, name recognition, and he's still quite popular. He resigned from the position of leadership. He is still a politician, and he may come back for another run at the presidency. In 2012, he ran against Park geun He was defeated, of course. Uh, but he still maintained a, a strong backing by the populace. He's, he's always cited as someone who could run for president. The second is, as we've discussed before, An Cho Su. Bit of a dark horse. We don't exactly know what his plan is going forward. Uh, he's now in a position where he can run for president. Whether he will or not will probably depend on the first thing I talked about, what the left decides to do. Because if Moon Jae-in and An Cho Su are both running for president, neither are going to win. Anyway, things may change. New people may enter the political fray. They may throw their hat in the ring and run for president. There are certainly a long list of people who have the name recognition and the popular support. And as we discussed in previous questions, a lot of South Korean politics are personality driven. So you don't exactly have to be a skilled, experienced politician to do well or to win the presidency. So we will see. It shall be interesting. Stephen Denny, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.